Um, so I have five questions for you. The first one being, what advice do you have for those at the beginning of their career um, in terms of writing? Well, the advantage of writing as opposed to other aspects of what we do is you can always be writing. Uh, actors can't act without a part, directors can't direct without a project, and so forth, but writers can always be writing. So the first piece of advice is always be writing. Uh, the question about what, what you should be writing or what you should be doing with your writing, those are uh, not as easy to answer. But um, my teaching mentor, Robert Anderson, the playwright, used to say that a, a young poet is 16, a young novelist is 26, and a young playwright is 36. And there are a lot of reasons for that, and I think that those ages have all come down a little bit in today's accelerated social environment. But as a rule of thumb, it's to say that you, you don't have to be famous by Friday. Um, you need to uh, be sure that uh, every script that you're writing, you're learning something from, you care about it. If you're writing in television, which is what I know best, you know, I suggest that you start by looking at the shows that you love uh, and reverse engineering some episodes. You know, with DVRs now, you can always uh, look and stop them, take a look at them, write the outline, figure out how they're structured, figure out what makes them tick, and you do the same thing with movies. And it's not the same thing as reading a script or reading an outline. If you actually do the work and back it up, you'll learn a lot about what goes into the structure of a screenplay, because screenplays are so dependent upon structure. It's not just writing dialogue. It's not just creating characters. It's, it's uh, William Goldman is likened it to a, a screenplay to a piece of furniture. You know, if you can, you can have beautiful woodwork and inlay, but if it only has three legs instead of four, or if one leg is too short, it's not gonna hold anything. Uh, so you have to spend the time um, uh, with your craft, and, uh, uh, and that takes time, and it takes patience, and uh, part of your talent is gonna be the talent for hard work and resourcefulness, and, and uh, be ambitious enough to be patient. That would be my advice. Great advice. Okay, so my second question is, what project are you most proud of and why? You know, I've had the good fortune to work on a number of terrific shows. I'd say in terms of just purely the writing, uh, it would have to be Northern Exposure, which we kind of mm -hmm. knew at the time was an unusually uh, distinguished show. Um, you know, to have success in any aspect of this business, the planets have to line up correctly, and in this case they did. It was a wonderful uh, script that created the show. We had terrific actors, um, uh, directors, producers, and so th there are a number of scripts I've written for that uh, that I just felt privileged that I was able to actually, I couldn't believe I was writing some of them there because the material was so, uh, just so much fun to work with, so unusual for television at the time. And, and sadly, I don't think that you could sell Northern Exposure today. I think that most uh, studios in that would say, oh, that's too soft. Who's going to mm -hmm. watch that? And yet, of all the shows I've worked on, and I've worked on a dozen, that's the one that people say, oh, you worked on Northern Exposure? I love that show. Why did that show ever go off the air? Um, so that would probably be the proudest moment. The most fun I ever had uh, was the first show I worked on, Remington Steel. Um, I was new to the business. I had been a journalist for seven years. I had uh, just met my wife, the woman should not be my wife, the weekend before I started work there. Uh, everything was going on. My children were born during that period of time. And uh, my closest friend in the business is uh, somebody I met working on that show. So um, that was the most charm period of time. But, but in terms of uh, creative heights, uh, in fact, it was a bit of a problem on Northern Exposure because what, what do you do when you're you know, in, your, in your 40s and you're thinking, I'm never going to write something that's going to be more distinguished than this. You know, it's like the high watermark. Of your, I'm going to follow this up. And of course, you keep going and keep trying to write other stuff. But we knew at the time that we were part of something very special. Awesome. Okay, question number three. If you have writer's block, what can you do to overcome it? Um, I don't believe in writer's block. So the, you know, when you're a professional writer, you just can't afford to have writer's block. So uh, you just have to, so the obvious answer is you keep working through it and, and, and don't believe in it. It's if you're having a problem, go out, take a walk, uh, go to a ball game, watch a movie, come mm -hmm. back to the desk, but keep working. You can't, uh, I've always been a writer for hire in the sense that I've started out as a journalist and if the story had to be on the wire at five that night, it had to be on the wire at five that night. Mm -hmm. um, there were two expressions that were always used when I was starting out as a journalist, get it done, son, and keep it simple, stupid, kiss, K-I-S-S, -S, you know? And so I think having that as a background, I just, you know, and I had a mortgage to pay for and my house to feed, I couldn't afford to have writer's block. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it's an indulgence that most professional writers can't have. Um, so 
I would say uh, get rid of that concept and if you have a problem, and we all have problems, mm -hmm. work through it. And as I told an anecdote today, if, if, if you're having trouble meeting your standards, lower your standards. Just keep writing and, and, and keep going. I like that. Question number four. Um, what can the film industry do differently to change or grow? So the question about how the film and TV industry can change to grow may be peculiar more to Canada than it is to the United States. In the United States, if anything, you know, it's exploding. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, uh, so, I don't have an answer necessarily for that here. I, I've tried to understand a little bit better in the time I've had here what uh, particular strengths and limitations of the Canadian business is, and it seems it, it's just too different, and I've been here too short a period of time to comment with any uh, uh, helpful uh, specificity, because I don't think it's a problem in the States. I mm. think the problem in the States is, if anything, there's too much. I would mm. never say that necessarily. but. Uh, um, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of hysteria in the United States, so we don't have that issue. I don't think anybody would say that's our problem. Mm -hmm. um, keeping some of the venues alive um, or thriving, when I started out in network television, uh, a show could get canceled with 20, 25 million viewers. Now that would make it the most successful show on television. So uh, the problem for the broadcast network was how they can sustain their economic model uh, in the face of all this competition. But that's a very different problem than the one that you posed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we all have mentors. Uh, these are the people who give us the hope, inspiration, and drive to keep going. So who are the people who have been your mentors and why? Well, three people come to mind. Uh, okay. First, my high school drama teacher, mm -hmm. named Barbara Greener Patterson. She was um, uh, just a fantastic high school drama teacher. I was um, on the debate team my freshman year. I, I played a little football, but I was on the debate team and thinking I was going to be a lawyer. And then I met her and saw what she did with the theater there. And um, I tried out for a show, but I got so uh, nervous that I actually pulled my audition slip. I did not audition. And she ended up putting me on the production as her assistant. I guess she saw something in me. And so I, I got to sit at her side for every rehearsal for Oklahoma, that was the musical we were doing at the time. And after that, it built my confidence. I learned so much being with her that I, st I, I was involved with theater production every semester for the rest of my uh, high school days. And to give you some idea of her impact, uh, the actors Gary Sinise and Jeff Perry also were classmates of mine. They were a year behind me, but we all acted together with her under high school. And Jeff and Gary, along with John Malkovich, won the Steppenwolf Theater Company. And uh, and, and Jeff has now got a prominent part on Scandal, and Gary did CSI, among mm -hmm. other things, and they have long and, and, and storied careers. And all three of us openly acknowledge that, that, uh, that uh, Mrs. Patterson, or Mrs. Greener, she was to us when we knew her, um, was responsible. So she was a huge influence. I, I would not have started on the path that, that I was on without her. Um, then uh, in college, Robert Anderson, the playwright and, and, and screenwriter and novelist, he wrote Tea and Sympathy, and I never sang for my father, and he wrote some really excellent screenplays too, including uh, A Nun's Story and The Sand Pebbles. He uh, taught for a semester my senior year, and to have the attention and the mentorship of a guy who's that accomplished um, and uh, was terrific. And we maintained a correspondence beyond college until he uh, finally developed Alzheimer's. He died a couple of years ago, but he was, um, he was a big influence because he gave me the belief that I could make it as a professional writer. He treated me respectfully and as a peer. He treated everybody that way, but for me it had a particular impact. Um, and then my first boss in the business on Remington Steel was a lovely guy named Michael Gleason. And uh, he had started out in theater in New York and had done a number of uh, shows and, and he was the guy who created Remington Steel. And as I got to know him, he was very generous with his time. and. Uh, and just spiritually very generous and taught me a lot about the business. And I spent three years on that show and that's really what gave me my footing in television. And, um, everybody should be lucky enough to work with somebody like that. I realized only later in my career that where I was very fortunate is that the first few shows I worked on all lasted a long time. Um, I got onto Remington in its second year and it went four years. I got into Hill Street Blues on its seventh year. Now I only worked on it for its last year, but it had been on the air for a while. Uh, when, in a, when I got to Northern Exposure, it was episode 17, and I stayed on episode 112. Wow. My first show writing job was Picket Fences, and it was in its fourth year, and it turned out to be its final year, but, uh, but the show had a history. And there's so much to learn in, in this business, and I didn't realize when I talked to friends of mine who I knew briefly on, on Remington Steel that for the first 10 years of their career, they never came back to the same office for more than a year. 
and uh, and that's more common than it is uncommon. And I didn't realize that. I thought it, my experience was that we all see things through our own prism, and I thought, oh well, everybody gets a chance to work on a long-running show, but they don't. And for your first job, in my case, to come to a show in the second year, so it already stabilized a little bit, to have the opportunity to work with somebody like Michael and just concentrate on making the best shows we could and not worry about whether we were going to survive or not, and because we squeaked by and for three more years. Um, that was invaluable, so I, I owe him a lot. So it would be my high school drama teacher, Robert Anderson, my writing teacher, and Michael, my first boss. They were all hugely important to me. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you.